Good morning, good morning, welcome, welcome everyone. Continuing in our study of Matthew 13, we'll continue and pick up at the uh, second and third parable, which will include the uh, next two uh, cities in our prophetic profile of the uh, Revelation 2, which would be Smyrna and Pergamos. We've got an interesting side note on Smyrna, too, you'll, I think you'll like Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this time. Get to spending your word. And help me, Father, to be able to do it in a way that's honoring to you. We give you praise and thanks in all that you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so let's get some verses in here. And I will use, again, we'll come back to our chart. So we started off and we talked about why parables. And then we talked about uh, getting into the format we're going to go through. And the fact that it's not in order. So that uh, we took on the uh, sower and the four soils with the explanation. So today we're going to look at tares and wheat and the explanation. And hopefully throw in mustard seeds too. So we'll see how it goes. So verses... So again, uh, the setting we're at having to do with uh, I think I'll bring in our, our, our nice uh, scene again on the lake or on the, uh, the, the lake it's actually about the size of a lake but the Sea of Galilee and uh, so it uses a backdrop because as we will see here in verses one and two, the same day when Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And a great multitude were gathered together unto him so that he went into a ship and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore. So that's where we're at. That's why I kind of picked his background. And again, uh, today we're gonna to pick up, so we're gonna look at verses three through nine. I mean, I'm sorry. 24 through 30, which will cover the tares and wheat. Then we'll look at the explanation that Jesus gives for that for that particular parable, how it applies to the city of Smyrna, the parallel, sir. And then we'll look at the mustard seed and also its parallel city of uh, Pergamos. So let's get into it. Verse 23 through 26. I'll do first, I'll read through the uh, parable, and then we'll kind of pick out some uh, different uh, interesting topics about it. And the parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man who sowed a good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the household came and said unto him, Sir, dost thou, not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence they then hath it tares. Tares are actually a uh, a plant, it's a, a weed that is actually poisonous. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a, minute, in a few minutes. It's a great parallel to uh, how Satan influences the church. Verse 28. He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, at least while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather up the, together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So that is the parable of the wheat and tares. And so let's kind of take a look at this. Going back to verses 24 through 26. And another parable put he forth saying, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, realize that the sower in this case is actually Jesus Christ, is symbolic of Jesus Christ. So he's not necessarily asleep because the Lord never sleeps. This is a side note. But uh, the enemy came in and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. 
So tares. Tear is a, uh, it's called Zizania uh, in the uh, Hebrew, uh, I mean Greek. It's a seed in Palestine today that looks just like wheat while it is growing. It looks very, very like it. But then when it matures, it turns black. And you can almost see that symbolically as it uh, it, it shows its true color of uh, of being of being evil. <clears throat> because if it gets mixed up in the wheat, you bake bread with it. It's actually poisonous, so you must separate it out. So you got to wait for this for the seed to actually come to full from maturity to be able to tell which one is which. <clears throat> But when the blade was sprung up and brought and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So, so Jesus is, uh, is showing here that uh, symbolically this is showing uh, the age of the church. So here when, when we talk about the fruit, we're talking about the church itself. So within the church, you're going to have people that are born again believers, the good fruit. And you're going to have the tares, which are the uh, evil ones. And the enemy that Jesus is talking about is Satan. We could go on to explain that when we get into the uh, latter part of this. Let's finish uh, up a few more things in verses 27 through 30. So the servants of the household came and said unto her, Sir, didst thou not thou sow good seed in the field? From whence the, then hath it tares? So the, the servants are actually wondering what happened here. Didn't you buy some good seed? Uh, How did you get this bad seed mixed in? And that's when Jesus... Let us know that uh, the enemy had done this. The servant said to him, well, all of it. So they want to go in there and try to separate it out. And Jesus is basically saying that he's going to take care of that at the end. The end being uh, actually when we, uh, during the resurrection, during the rapture. So tears also, I see tears also as false teachers. Uh, and some verses on that, in 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transferring themselves into the apostles of Christ. Remember, the wheat, the wheat and the tares look the same as they're growing up. And no model for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Sometimes you can't see Satan. He doesn't, he doesn't announce himself. He doesn't wear a name tag. Uh, and at first, you, sometimes you can't tell. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also being transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Also in Galatians 1, 7 through 9. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that, than that which was we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So it's really, really important, and Paul's talking about here, let me finish up with verse 9. We said before, so say I again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. That's why it's so important to know the true gospel from the word of God so you can tell when the counterfeit comes in. It's the same way they do money. Uh, you would think that they teach tellers how to identify uh, counterfeit money. You no, know, what they actually do is that they only allow them to handle good money. So the minute somebody comes in with, with the counterfeit money, you can tell that they can feel it right away. Same idea here is if you know the word of God backwards and forwards, then you're going to be able to tell when there's a false doctrine coming in. And also Galatians 2, 4. Now, because of false brother, uh, brother and unaware brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might uh, bring us into bondage. <clears throat> Also Hebrews 12, 15 and 16. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of the bitterness spring up, trouble you, therefore many be defiled. Let there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Also 2 Peter 2, 1 and 2. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. <clears throat> and many shall follow their precacious ways, by reason of whom the way of the truth shall be evilly spoken of. But they're almost always going to uh, try to deny some of the truths of the gospel. <clears throat> uh, 
Okay, so let's see, let's guys, Jesus, Jesus is going to give us an explanation and help us. The reason they're out of order, by the way, is because a lot of these explanations came later when the apostles were asking Jesus about them. So right now, Jesus is actually preaching to people. But later on, the apostles are going to ask him uh, the meaning behind it. That's why but I'm putting them in order so we can kind of compare them uh, together. Okay, so the actual explanation comes from verses 36 through 39. Let's look at that. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. <laughs> and he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. He's talking about himself. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. So the seed is actually us. If you're a child of God, but uh, Satan has his buddies too and his children, and uh, they're the tares in this particular parable. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. And therefore, the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. So we're talking about after the tribulation. And I found this, uh, typically we see this term, end of the world. Uh, it's actually a term that's found six times in this paragraph. And so there are a lot, that's why I truly believe this, this par these parables are speaking to the church. Because we're, we're, we're beyond the point here of talking about just the time Jesus is, on, uh, is ministering on the earth. Uh, he's actually talking about at the end of all things. And you actually see this in verses uh, 39, 40, which we already read. Also in verse 49, so shall it be at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked one from among the just. We'll get to that later on. It's also in chapter 24, verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So that's, uh, that's Matthew 24. We'll get into that. Uh, that's actually Jesus talking about the tribulation period. And also in uh, Matthew 28, 20. So I wanted to kind of show you that this term Jesus uses is almost always talking, is always talking about the end of the world being after, uh, even after our time frame, or after the age of the church. So here in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. It's also in Hebrews 9, 26, it says the same thing. So then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. It just turns it from end to foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So that term is actually a, a, a great term to show us that there, we are definitely talking about uh, uh, the end of the world, meaning after the tribulation. So again, going back to these parallels, and let me get that... Uh, So these are these parallels I've been talking about. And so we just mentioned the tares and the wheat. And that would be the uh, city of Smyrna, the church at Smyrna. And uh, here's a diagram of all the churches. So if you look at Smyrna, Smyrna was the persecuted church. And the funny thing about these particular order, just like we see here in this particular order, we see in these seven kingdom parables, they actually show a history of the church also. So you see the tares and the wheat. What is what has Satan been doing this whole time? He's been trying to uh, stop the church from uh, from forming. First off, first he tried to eliminate Jesus from being born, and now his ultimate goal, as we move into the church age, is to make the church ineffective. So that's why he puts these false teachers into the church, and you can kind of see that. And a very similar thing was happening in the time frame of Smyrna. Smyrna. Uh, was a church that was in existence from about 100 to about 316 AD. And Satan sowing in tears into the church of false teachers. This was happening in this particular early persecuted church. 
nothing negative said of this church. They were faithful unto death. And one of the famous martyrs was the one Jesus mentions in verse 10. So let's read through this. And to the end, unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Notice Jesus also has a name for himself in each one of these churches. And this one he says, I'm the first and the last, meaning he's the Alpha and Omega, he's the beginning and the end, which was dead and is alive. So meaning that he did die for our sins and he's alive again. But it's also this is talking about the fact that the, during this period of time, the church was really struggling to stay alive. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not. See, people infiltrating the church. They're saying that they're saying they're true believers, but they're not. But out of the synagogue of Satan. This is Jesus speaking, by the way. Verse 10. And this one, kind of pay close attention to this because I'm going to mention something afterwards about this particular one. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt by the second death. So Smyrna, a very famous uh, person came out of this particular church age and was actually the, uh, the bishop of Smyrna. His name was Polycarp. And you might have heard of him. It's actually a pretty good movie I've watched out a few times. Uh, I watched it once called Polycarp. And it's a really good movie of his life, uh, of what we know of it. He was actually personally trained by John the, uh, John the Apostle. And it... Uh, he was a Christian bishop of Smyrna, according to the martyrdom of Polycarp. There's a book out there. He died a martyr and bound and burned at the stake, then stabbed when the fire failed to consume his body. Both Anarinus and Tertullian say that Polycarp had been a disciple of John the Apostle, one of Jesus' disciples. In the book uh, On Illustratious Men, Jerome writes, that Polycarp was a disciple of John the Apostle and that John had ordained him the Bishop of Smyrna. Polycarp is regarded as one of the three chief apostolic fathers, along with Clement of Rome and uh, Ignatius of uh, Antioch. So I thought that would be an interesting little thing to realize that uh, uh, if you watch that movie, I really kind of enjoyed it. It kind of sets the scene that Polycarp was really instrumental in trying to get the gospel spread throughout the whole, uh, all these cities are in the uh, eastern Turkey area. Uh, and he was trying to move. Come in. Oh. Trying to move into the, uh, uh, trying to move the gospel out because he was actually a uh, uh, scribe. So he was transcribing the uh probably mostly the New Testament and trying to spread it out to the new church that was developing in that first century, first, first, second and third century. So I found that look kind of interesting. Now moving into the next one, which is the mustard seed. Mustard seed, let's read through it. It's only two verses. The next, the, the rest of them are going to be rather short, uh, each one of them. Uh, some of them have some really interesting side notes to them, though. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like the grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. Can I finish reading that? Yeah. Which indeed is the least of all seeds, and when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree. So the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. So the mustard seed, believe it or not, and this is Jesus speaking. So he's given a parable here. So it's an example. It says here, it's the least of all the seeds, but when it's grown, it is the greatest among herbs. So he's making a comparison here. It becometh a tree. Well, believe it or not, a mustard seed only grows into a bush. Uh, it's probably no bigger than about uh, 
68 big. It's pretty small. Uh, I think it's mo no more than about three feet high. So he, he compares it to a tree and birds. Birds in parables are always bad things. Birds are evil in, in parables. So the parable of the mustard seed prefigures the rapid but unsubstantial growth of the mystery form of the kingdom from the insignificant beginning to a great place in earth. We see this a little bit in Acts 1.15. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120. So he was talking to about 120 people. So it's kind of showing here that it started off really, really fairly small. The 12 apostles was really the beginning of the church. But as you move through Acts, you see that Peter is really adding to the church daily, uh, thousands. We jump into Acts 2.41. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That was during one sermon by Peter. Uh, and Paul also mentions in 1 Corinthians 1.26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. So to a great place in earth, the figure of the fowls finding shelter in the branches actually comes from a uh, from Daniel. It's in Daniel 4, 20 through 22. And let's read through that. So I want you to understand that a bird would not put a nest into a bush, uh, not three foot high. So you can see the analogy here is that uh, basically the church started small, but it got bigger and bigger and bigger. But as it got bigger and bigger, then infiltrated the uh, the birds and, and built nests in them. That's the idea of the evil being impregnated into the church. So let's read Daniel 4, 20 through 22. The tree that thou sawest which grew and was strong whose height reaches up to heaven and the sight thereof to all the earth. This is the dream that Daniel was uh, was uh, was talking about to uh, uh, Belteshazzar, whose leaves were fair and the fruit thereof much, and it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for the greatest is grown and reaches unto heaven, and I domain to the end of the earth. Okay, so I want, uh, so that's, you can see that whenever something grows like that, and this goes on to talk about the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is actually the Nebuchadnezzar. This is when he found out that, this is actually Nebuchadnezzar uh, relaying this. This is a dream that Nebuchadnezzar had and ended up being his demise when he was actually struck down by God for his pride over his kingdom. But I want you to see that idea of the, 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 the uh, birds. The fowls of the heaven had their habitation. So they, uh, again, in, in these kind of six, uh, parables, the fowls are always talking about uh, uh, evil. So unsecure was such a refuge the context in Daniel shows. So again, mustard seeds uh, grow into bushes about three foot tall. And have you ever seen a bird put a nest in a three foot uh, bush? I don't think so. The mustard seed apparently grows to become a mon uh, monstrosity, something larger than it's supposed to. It becomes a structure so large and spacious that the birds come in large in the branches. Birds are all. Uh, Birds are the birds that picked up the seed in the first parable, the ministers of Satan. Remember, this, the birds came and took the seed uh, that fell in the rocks uh, off to the side. So you can see the birds in, in these parables are always uh, typically talk about Satan. So you get the idea here. This particular church has grown so big and so powerful that uh, it is a uh, representative of a uh, Beyond its beyond its its capacity, and that the uh, that it's basically being fed by Satan is what the, what the idea being is, and this and the church that marries uh, it comes to this is Pergamus. And Pergamus here is better known as the married church. Pergamus was in existence from 316 to 606 A.D. 
was basically the church with bad surroundings. Steadfastness, even within an evil world, married to the world period when the government controlled the church. There was a period of time where the, where the, uh, the beginning of the Catholic Church where the papal powers, uh, power was, was dominant, uh, particularly in Europe and in uh, and, and Asia. And it uh, basically world leaders would appoint the, par the, uh, the, the popes and so that the popes were, were responsible to the kings of that area. So you can see the, the, the idea of the married church, they're married to the world. So they care more about what the king thinks than they do about what God thinks. We can see how the mustard bush has grown into a tree in this parable. Of all the churches developed in this day and age, the Roman Catholic is the largest. Could this speak to the, to the bush that became a tree? I kind of think so. Uh, one of the verses that comes to mind, and I didn't get it out. Uh, I think I put it somewhere else. But continuing in this, uh, I didn't read through Pergamus yet either. Uh, let me read through the, the verses on Pergamus. So you get an idea of what I'm talking about here, and, you, and you'll see, I think you'll see the connection. And to the angel of the church in Pergamus write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. When you see that, it's usually talking about the word of God, the sharp sword with two edges. Is, uh, typically when, God's, when Jesus says that, he's talking about his word. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Nipotus was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. So you can see Satan has kind of in, in, infiltrated the church. That's, the, that's what, the idea you get here. Same thing with the mustard seed. That the, uh, the original intent of the church was small and, uh, and unique, and it was uh, they were faithful to God, where it grew into something way out of control. That's the idea behind the mustard seed. Continuing here, Revelation 2.14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast, the, they are them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now here's this verse that we are talking about in our numbers study. Remember who Balaam was, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Do you think sacrifice unto idols and to commit fornication? So let's talk about that, the, the doctrine of Balaam. Let me finish reading this first, and we'll get back to that. So hast thou, uh, hast thou all that thou also them that hold the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which we or we already talked about that too in uh, in our first church, which which thing I hate. We're going to talk about that too in the study. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saying that he that receiveth it. So back to verse 214. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast taken this whole, this doctrine of Balaam. The doctrine of Balaam, we actually see this doctrine of Balaam mentioned a few times in the New Testament. I remember the story from Numbers, and basically uh, Balak had asked Balaam to curse Israel. Now, Balaam refused to curse Israel, but he went about it a different way. He kind of advised that King Balak to actually uh, entice the uh, Israelites to, com to commit fornication uh, by sacrificing things to idols and to actually uh, engage in sexual relations with people outside their, their people group. Uh, Back in that time frame, God was very strict about the fact that the, the Jews were not supposed to go outside their own people's group, uh, followers of Christ, of God, and actually met, mingle with people who are idol worshipers. So that's what uh, Balaam actually suggested Balak to do, and it worked. So God had to take action. He actually uh, had a plague kill about 24,000 Israelites because they had gone out to commit fornication with these folks. So that's the doctrine of Balaam. In other words, enticing people to do wrong. It's also mentioned in 2 Peter 2.15. 
which had forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beazar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. That was the other thing, too, is that uh, Balaam typically would, uh, would do things for people for money. And also in Jude 1, uh, verse 11, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the arrow of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gain slaying of Kor. So it was teaching Balaam to corrupt the people who could not be cursed. And that goes all the way back to Numbers 31, 15, and 16. And Moses said to them, Have you saved all the women alive? Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Jump into uh, verse 23, 8. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defiled? That 23.8 is actually uh, what God had originally told Balaam, and Balaam told that to Balak. So that's why they found another way around God's rule. By tempting the married women of Moab, defile their separation and abandon their pilgrim character, there's that union with the world and the church, which is spiritually, with spiritual unchastity. James, uh, I mentioned this in verse uh, chapter 4, verse 4. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And Pergamos had lost the pilgrim character and was dwelling where Satan's throne is. We saw that in verse 13. But basically in the world. They were, they were married to the world. John mentions this a few times. John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. John 14, 30. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. The prince of this world is talking about uh, Satan. And also John 16, 11. Uh, judgment because the prince of this world is judged. So Jesus going to the cross. He was actually judging and taking back the world from Satan. Then the other one that's mentioned in Revelation 2.15 is this, this doctrine of Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Nicolaitans, that, that, we don't have solid proof that that group of people existed, but it actually could be just a, a, a basic doctrine, not necessarily a people group, but it's a way of people uh, and how they control other people. And then, and the actual word comes from Nico to conquer and laos, the people or laity. So there is no so basically to to control the laity. And there was no ancient authority for a sect of the Nicolaitans, but here Jesus actually says that he hates the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So it's basically talking about clergy that actually controls the people and forces them to do things based on him, not necessarily by God, on God. So if the world is symbolic, it refers to the earliest form of the notion of a priestly order or clergy, which later divided an equal brotherhood into priests and laity. We see this in Matthew 23, 8. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. So it was meaning that the only people we, 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 we are uh, report to is uh, Jesus Christ, and that we aren't, we aren't under the, influ the direct influence. And Jesus is going to explain that here. So what in Ephesus was called deeds, remember we talked about that in uh, Ephesus, and that was in Revelation 2, 6. But this thou hast, that thou hast the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. But here it actually mentions, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine. Now it's a doctrine, not just a deed, which thing I hate. Had become in Pergamus a doctrine. And this is in contradiction to what First Peter 5, 2 and 3 says. This is the way it should be. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but for ready of mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. So it's by example that we show uh, to the people, not by, uh, by control. 
I see, you know, you know, and boy, I don't, I won't say I'm an expert on the Catholic Church, but I see a lot of this within. Uh, we see it started here in this particular time frame in the uh, basically the medieval age around 600 BC, uh, AD. And of course, this is talking about Pergamus, the married church. This will actually turn into the uh, the full Catholic Church. This is just the beginning stages of it, but it, it's a stage where the church was actually married to the world, and it's where the, uh, they cared more about the world than they cared about God. So this pattern in the, ch in the, ch in the Catholic Church got started here, where basically uh, people are under control of the laity. If you talk to the average uh, Catholic, the, uh, uh, what the Pope says goes, and we're not supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be one of uh, example, but not necessarily uh, by the type of control that the the Pope and the, and, the, and the priests have over the people. Like the whole confession thing where you go into the priest and you confess your sins and he tells you what to do to, to get forgiven for them. Man ain't supposed to have that kind of power. Only God does. They also talk about a place called purgatory is the place where you go until your penance is paid. It's another thing, uh, talking about this idea of being uh, uh, a filthy, filthy lucre we just mentioned. There's actually, back in this particular time frame, you could actually pay the Catholic Church and supposedly get people out of purgatory. Purgatory was supposedly a place where when you die, you go to pay your penance. And once you pay your penance, then you're accepted into heaven. There is no such place. It's no, not, not in the Bible anyway. This is something that came up with the Catholic Church. And I see a similar thing even today. And like the, the Mormons, they, they do this thing called baptizing the dead. But basically, that you can somehow save somebody that's already gone. And again, I don't know the the full extent of those different doctrines. I'm sure that people maybe have different ideas of what they say. But at least from the surface of what I know, uh, it really looks like they're taking on this doctrine. And that's basically what Balak hired Balaam to do. Uh, so, folks, the decision to accept Jesus Christ is free, and I mean free. It's, uh, you don't need to pay for it. It's a gift of salvation. It's done without any special system of payment. During this particular age, one of the other things you could do, you could actually, uh, you could actually buy what they call indulg indulgences. It was these indulgences that actually got people, loved ones, freed from purgatory. And there was a period of time that supposedly now they stopped that. This, this, this got stopped about 1500 uh, AD. But that... Uh, but the idea of penance really hasn't gone away, uh, is that uh, you can do certain things, and it's a works-based uh, thing where you do certain things and you actually get indulgences, which will help pay uh, penance. So I just wanted to go on and say, and, and at this point, point to the fact that what Jesus says, and what God says about uh, this free gift of salvation, you can't pay, you can't buy it. And in Romans 10, 9 through 13, I just want to mention this part, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. No payments, no penance, no, no going to purgatory. But within the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You go directly to the Lord, no intermediate, no, no going to any saints, no praying to Mary, nobody. You go straight to the Lord with this. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So it's plain and simple. You don't need to confess to a priest or anyone else. Just a simple prayer to Jesus confessing you're a sinner in need of this free gift to give your life over to Jesus and have him do the rest. Uh, it's up to, and don't think you have to fix something before you go before you get accepted by Jesus. Come as you are. He's going, to, he's going to be the one that helps you to get fixed. And, and what's so important, too, and I think in this day and age, is to find a, a nice ch church Bible believing Christians. And in my experience, the best ones 
are the independent Baptist churches and other non-denominational churches of which they're out there. Very important, as I mentioned in verse 15 of Romans 10, to get proper preaching by someone who was sent. If you're in the Florence area also, I may suggest Fairhaven Baptist Church in Coolidge, but there are others, and if you ask through the chat, I can help you find one where you are. Some say, well, I can watch online, and yes, it's okay if there's none in your area, but based on the time we are in, and this is what Hebrews 10.25 says, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We should be getting together with these with fellow Christians. We should be fellowshipping, caring for one another, uh, getting to know one another, knowing the families, knowing who you're praying for. I spent uh, quite a while during COVID because of my because uh, of my uh, heart transplant, and the fear of catching COVID could really be dangerous, damaging to me. So I spent a long time watching online, and I tell you. I really, uh, I miss going to church and being with people, and it, uh, it was really noticeable, and I was, I was really getting uh, a really discouraged feeling, and my relationship was uh, not good, uh, and so that uh, once I was able to get back into church and be with people, even if it's at a distance, uh, it was so important to, to our well-being. I think we're a people that needs other people in our lives. We can't just sit at home and watch things on TV or videos. It's got to be in person. So I just wanted to tack that in there because uh, cause we were talking about that particular, the married church to the world. And that uh, I see that happening again. If we move these through these other churches, you're going to see as we progress through these, uh, these particular parables, it's going to become more and more noticeable that uh, we're watching the church age develop all the way through. And right now we're in, uh, you know, we're in the Middle Ages, uh, where the church got married to itself, and we saw this idea of the uh, the mustard seed, where this thing that was supposed to be so pure and natural grew into this monstrosity that was uh, was more about making money, about pleasing the world, than it was about pleasing God. So, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, oh, thank you, Lord, so much uh, for this opportunity to share your word. And uh, thank you, Lord, for my salvation and that uh, for all those out there seeking you, that uh, those listening uh, to this, this message might, uh, that don't know you, may they turn to you and, uh, and, uh, and uh, look to you for their guidance and for their, for their salvation. And we give you all the praise and thanks and all that you do. And that uh, we praise you and we hope to uh, uh, see you one day real soon. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So uh, tomorrow we will continue and we will get into, uh, let's see, the next part is, where is my little chart? So we did Smyrna and Pergamus. So the next one is the woman in the leaven. Uh, that's another interesting. Thyatira. This goes full fledged into the uh, period of uh, the of the uh, the Catholic Church. Better known as the mid medieval church. So this is the uh, this is like from 600 A.D. to uh, 1500 A.D. And then we get into the denominational churches, which uh, which is talking about that's the Reformation. That's when uh, 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 Luther uh, actually split away from the Catholic Church because he was tired of the uh, apostasy going on. And that was the beginning of the denominational churches. Then, of course, coming into our era, the missionary church, Philadelphia, that's when the missionary forces and America came into existence. So that's, uh, that's that period of time. And we are right now in Laodicea, the apostate church. Uh, is that, that's what I believe. So it's going to look forward to as we go look through those. So I'll talk to you guys again tomorrow. Have a great day. As we depart from the Sea of Galilee.